This is the story of a year. A year spent in a secondary modern school in the green countryside of Buckinghamshire, not far from London. The Chalfonts County Secondary School is a young school, and it is growing like its children. Because of this, the story is unfinished, and other stories of the school wait to be told. But let us begin at the beginning. The summer holidays are over, and our scene opens on the first day of term. Yes, that date in September, which seemed infinite ages away when the long summer holiday began in July, has really arrived. Back to school. Cards and shop windows displaying school uniforms have borne this message for some time, and today it really is back to school in earnest. And back to the school on the hill we come, in twos and threes, meeting our friends and having so much to talk about. But for some of us, it is not back to the same school. We are the 11-year-olds who have now left the primary school, and today is an exciting day for us, our very first day at a new school. Of course, we know quite a number of children who were with us at our last school. But as we walk up to the school entrance, lots of questions about this new school of ours crowd into our minds. Yes, I was one of the new 11-year-olds. My name is Marion Brett. I certainly was wondering all sorts of things. What class would I be in? Who would be my class teacher? Who would I sit next to? One of my friends or someone totally strange? What new subjects would I be learning about? These were only some of the thoughts that came teeming into my mind. Yes, the teacher really blew that whistle. At the sound, we lined up and were very soon walking into the school hall. Here, Mr. Hawley, the headmaster, awaited us. One of the most important points that I made to the new pupils was that they would all be given certain test papers to work through that morning. I explained that on the results of these tests would largely depend how the children were arranged in their new classes. Those test papers certainly meant a busy morning for us. There was plenty of work to be done in both arithmetic and English. A lot of papers for the teachers to mark later on, too. Yes, quite a lot of marking. And we had to get on with it straight away, so that the children could be allocated to the right classes. To be more precise, this meant arranging some 135 children into four classes and trying to place each boy and girl in the class where he or she would be likely to make the most progress. I was placed in Form 1-2. One of the main teachers was our form master, and we occupied one of the two newest classrooms. I remember that very first lesson we had as a form was spelling. Yes, the new pupils have now begun to settle in. They get to know their form teacher and their form room. They make new friendships. They soon know their way around the school, and they become familiar with their day-to-day -day timetable. 
The form teachers of first year classes take their own forms several times during each six day cycle. There are two or three form periods devoted mainly to spelling, general knowledge, current affairs and so on. But the number of lessons which we have in our own form room with our form teacher is far less than the number we spend in other parts of the school, being taught by many different teachers. Our arithmetic and English lessons were taken by one of the lady teachers in the next classroom. This system of specialisation by the teachers was rather new to us as in the primary school, we were taught for the most part by the same teacher. We go to the geography room for our lessons with the geography master. Of course, the maps, atlases and so on are kept in his classroom. The main talk is Britain, our central Scotland, Northumberland and Durham, Cumberland, York, Nottinghamshire and Derbyshire, Lancashire, the Midlands, South Wales, Bristol, Coldfield and Kent. The history teacher takes us in his classroom. Textbooks and history maps are available for us here. In considering the Roman Empire, we have to forget that it started long before the Romans ever came to this country. But in order to... Another subject taken by the same teacher is technical drawing. The boys only take this subject. Again, we do not have this in our form room, but are taught by the master in his room. Drawing boards, various measuring instruments, and really sharp pencils are required. Boys and girls take general science in the first year. We have these lessons in the science laboratory, which of course is specially equipped with workbenches and apparatus. PE, or physical education, to give it its full name, is often taken out of doors. But if it is wet, or if we are carrying out exercises in agility, balance, or coordination using apparatus, then the PE lesson is held in the school hall, which has to serve as a gymnasium. We girls go to the needlework room, where the needlework mistress teaches us those skills which are so important if we are to make any of our own clothes later on. Here, of course, are the sewing machines, materials, ironing boards, etc. And so the first year forms settle down to learning these and several other subjects. Meanwhile, the second, third and fourth year forms, nine other classes in all, have been picking up the threads of the work of the previous year and have been getting used to the idea of being in a higher class, probably in a different room and with a different class teacher. Although we go to many different teachers in their specialist rooms for various lessons during the school day, there is a special link between our form and our form teacher. He or she keeps a genuinely friendly eye on us, keeps us informed on various school activities, timetable alterations and so forth, gingers us up on tidiness in desks, cloakrooms, etc. And it is to our form teacher that we often take our troubles, large or small, for each school form is a kind of family, though rather a large one. This is my form. I am in my fourth or final year at the secondary school. Here you see us during the last minutes of the registration period in the morning. The register had been called, dinner numbers checked, and we were reading while waiting for the bell to announce first lesson.
pupils go to their form rooms at the beginning of morning school, they join together in an act of corporate worship as a school. The headmaster conducts a short service, during which a pupil reads an appropriate passage from a modern translation of the Bible. The service over, the headmaster deals with matters of school routine and makes any special announcements that apply. <coughs> This is early in the new school year and new prefects have been appointed. The headmaster presents the prefects with their badges and at the same time reminds them and the assembled pupils of the authority and responsibility that go with the badge. Some of the boys in their final year at school are going to plan and build a pavilion at the edge of the school field. This work is to be done in practical periods during the normal school day and is organised and supervised by the form master. First the plans are drawn to scale. We obtained most of our building materials very cheaply from the disused camp of army huts, but it was hard work getting them. We learn that there is a right way and several wrong ways of demolition, particularly if you want to save as much as you can to use again. Perhaps we should have erected a sign, Danger, Young Men at Work. by no means ready to begin the work of building immediately. The site had to be prepared and some hard work put in on digging out the footings. Then came the very different job of estimating the cement and sand required and ordering it from a local builder's merchant. But soon with enthusiasm and gradually increasing skill, the first few coarser bricks were laid and truly laid as experience taught us how important the uses of the spirit level and plumb line really are. And before many weeks, the damp proofing course was reached. The first few weeks of the term, the weather is still warm. Summer is not yet over. On the school field, athletics are much in evidence. Putting the shot, the long jumps, the discus and other events are all practiced during and after school hours while the days are still long. And the school swimming pool is used right through September and even into October, depending, of course, upon the weather. At the fall of the year, the garden plots have to be cleared. After the summer, the grass and weeds are rampant, and the boys make a vigorous attack on them, as well as the decaying vegetable matter and dead flowers. Ode to Autumn by John Keats Season of mists and mellow fruitfulness Close bosom friend of the maturing sun Conspiring with him how to load and bless With fruit, the vines that round the thatch eaves run to bend with apples the mossed cottage trees and fill all fruits with ripeness to the core, to swell the gouge and plump the hazel shells with a sweet kernel, to set budding more and still more later flowers for the bees until they think warm days will never cease 
for summer has or brimmed their clammy cells. Who hath not seen thee oft amid thy store? Sometimes whoever seeks abroad may find me sitting careless on a granary floor, thy hair soft lifted by the winnowing wind, or in a half reaped furrow sound asleep, drowsed with a fume of poppies, while thy hook bears the next wave and all its twined flowers, and sometimes like a gleaner thou dost keep steady thy laden head across a brook, or by a cider press with patient look thou watchest the last oozing hours by hours. Now, as we come to school, the morning air is cold. The trees that stand around the school field become gradually more bare, in contrast to human beings who don warmer clothing to keep out the chill. Cooking can be warm work, though, but a cool head and a cool pair of hands are called for if pastries to be just right. Those sausage rolls look appetizing. With practiced eye, the domestic science teacher looks at the pie this girl has made. She seems fairly pleased as she gives it a mark. I wonder whether father gave it 10 out of 10 later. Good housekeeping starts with good shopping, and here the local fishmonger is playing his part in educating the housewives of the future. In this lecture, one of three he has very willingly undertaken, he is showing various flat fish and explaining points to note when buying. When buying place, in particular, the thing to look for is the bright spot on the back, on the dark side, and that should be red and bright or bright orange. <clears throat> the brighter the color, the better. The gill should be clear and the inside of the gut should also be pure white. If that is discolored, don't buy it because it has been lying about and it is not fresh. The lemon sole, uh, is the same, there's no spot on the, no bright red or yellow spots on the back. Hello, something fishy is happening here. Is this the one that got away? From fish in a plate to fish in a tank, this is the biology room. We have already seen this classroom as it is the home of Form 1-2. Biology, the science of living things, is taught to first and second year children and also to girls of the third and fourth year classes. The teachers of these subjects are particularly fortunate because every child has a natural interest in plants and animals and there is no shortage of visual aids to illustrate the lessons. Quite a lot of the work is formal, the teacher talking for a while followed by our making notes. There is also a modest library of reference books and we are encouraged to use them. But we all look forward to the lessons when we are allowed to watch the creatures that are kept at the back of the room. These are, for the most part, brought by the children and maintained by them. Some animals are kept for only a short period before being released, while others are regarded as old friends. Particular care is taken to see that no animal is kept which would suffer in confinement and so we are restricted to fish, insects, frogs and toads, lizards and other small creatures.
One tank of particular interest contains sea creatures. Many of these have been brought by children returning home from a day by the sea. And we are told that in the summer a party of children sometimes goes from the school to spend a day on biological fieldwork at a spot on the south coast. A marine aquarium is much easier to keep than many people imagine. The main difficulty lies in the need for real seawater, as ordinary salt dissolved in water will not do. The sea is an environment about which we know very little. It contains an abundance of plant and animal life of a very different kind from that on land. For example, echinoderms, that is, starfish and sea urchins, have no terrestrial or freshwater representatives at all. Perhaps the best known creatures of the deep belong to the class of animals known as crustacea. This includes prawns, crabs, lobsters and so on. The hermit crab belongs to this group. He is a funny fellow as he has to search around for an empty shell in which to live. The back portion of his body being very vulnerable. As he grows, so he needs to change his shell in the same way that we need new clothing as we grow up. Often, too, he places an anemone on his back. This serves as a protection against marauders. But if the hermit crab looks for his home, the house mouse makes his. Just place a loaf of stale bread in a mouse cage, and before long it nibbles a labyrinth of passages inside. Lizards make ideal pets. They are hardy and cause little bother at feeding time. But these reptiles are more than pets. They serve to remind us that at one period in the Earth's history, their kind ruled the Earth. The harmless little animals that we know today are representatives of the huge dinosaurs and other monsters of prehistoric times. We have to learn about these things and what better place could there be than the Natural History Museum in South Kensington? The journey time to the museum is about an hour by coach, and here we see a first year form one afternoon in mid-autumn. The object of the visit was to trace the development of life from the simplest forms up to the animals that we know today, including man himself. interest was the exhibit showing the development of flight through the ages. Here we saw a lifelike model of the Archaeopteryx, a lizard-like bird with teeth and claws on its wings. This is supposed to be the ancestor of our modern birds. As the Christmas term goes on, so the school pavilion goes up, the skill and confidence of the young builders increasing week by week. The window frames have now been put in, and we are beginning to get an idea of what the finished building will look like. The swimming season is now over. Maintenance work on the school swimming pool goes on. These senior boys are repairing and improving the sides of the pool and clearing it out. So the boys of the school 
look after a facility which past pupils made for them. gardens get their final dig through before the winter sets in. Outside sports and games have changed with the season. There are many matches to be played this winter and the soccer team has to brush up those skills and techniques which have lain dormant through the summer months. For the girls, there is netball. Here we have a senior league match with a neighbouring secondary school. Also, two visiting soccer teams from the same school. Here the boys are having a hard tussle, for the teams are very evenly matched. But the outcome of the afternoon sport was very satisfying for us. We won both football matches, the juniors by five goals to four, and the seniors by six goals to two. Another favourite outdoor activity is cross-country running. There is a two-mile course through the country lanes and footpaths around the school, and once a year, every able-bodied boy has to take part. There are actually two races, one for the juniors and one for the seniors. This is a senior event. It is quite a gruelling run, and the children who come in first have every reason to be proud of themselves, but it is a reminder to every boy to keep himself fit. We were accompanied for part of the way by members of staff, but they had to give up. Their car couldn't go over the stile. class is preparing for an external examination to be taken in June. The particular examinations chosen after much consideration were those of the Union of Educational Institutions. The girls taking the introductory commercial exams and the boys taking the introductory technical. I have to make a summary of the broad outline of the story. There will possibly be time to go into detail these boys and girls realize that there is much hard work ahead of them if they are to reach the required standard. Homework is compulsory in all the examination subjects. All the pupils take English in the UEI exams. It is an essential and fundamental subject. Even so, not all boys and girls find it easy to express themselves fluently and grammatically in writing and many of them need a great deal of individual help with this. Mathematics, too, is very important, and again a must for all the examination candidates. Boys and girls are together for some of their lessons, but have others separately, as they take different kinds of UEI maths papers. The boys are examined in general mathematics, and the girls in the arithmetic of commerce. Other subjects the boys are preparing for in their examination syllabus are science, technical drawing and woodwork, 
while the girls take commercial geography. This is only the second year that the school has prepared pupils to sit for these Union of Educational Institute examinations, but the first year's results have been encouraging and the staff are hopeful of gaining a greater proportion of successes this time. About 36 children will be trying this year, compared with 25 last year. Those children who pass some or all of the UEI exams will have gained a useful certificate, especially if it is their intention to continue their studies, take up apprenticeships, or enter some form of technical or professional training. But all of these children will gain a lot from this purposeful year of school work. While the boys are studying mechanics as part of their science course, the girls are being taken for commercial geography. Back to the boys again. This time it is a technical drawing lesson. The fourth year boys are being taken for this subject by the woodwork master as this allows better coordination of the two subjects at this vital stage. magic in the air that day we notice the holly berries for the first time and when we look at the calendar we see that we are getting very close to the end of term and as each day goes by so we are reminded more and more that the festive season is upon us and one lunchtime, when we go into the school canteen, we have Christmas pudding for dessert. All the girls in their final year at school make their family Christmas cake during the domestic science lessons. We take a great pride in the finished article, and our teacher goes to a great deal of trouble to help us give our cakes a professional finish. Some weeks in the second half of the term, several groups of children under various teachers have been learning their parts, rehearsing during dinner hours and after school. Now the great day has arrived. Tonight the show goes on. Girls who are going to dance in the Christmas tree dance, the cast of a fast cult sketch, and the cast of Scenes from Dickens, a Christmas carol, are costumed and made up.
Parents, pupils and friends fill the school hall to overflowing. On the stage, built by boys at the school, the curtain rises on the well-known story of Scrooge, Bob Cratchit and the Spirit of Christmas. Dances of the toys of the Christmas tree are charmingly done by girls of the lower school. a nativity play with carols, the three roses. The shepherds and the kings bring their gifts to the infant king. A lame tramp, a poor old lady and a ragged boy bring three roses. But the young girl, having no gift, offers herself. is over and some of us breathe a sigh of relief. It has gone well and now we can relax. As a sort of celebration on the evening before the last day of term there is a party and dance and the older children come really prepared to enjoy themselves. They have worked hard this term and they deserve it. After a first class tea prepared by the kitchen staff the party really gets going. There is something for everyone. Dancing, games, prizes, and a host of party favorites, old and new. And the next morning is the last day of term, a day of suppressed excitement and anticipation. The holidays are almost here, and after a day that seems to last longer than any other, we are once again in the hall, where the headmaster presents the house cup and deals with any other matters of importance. But for some, it is the last day of school. There are a few who have reached school leaving age this term and who have decided not to stay on to the end of the year. When we come back after the holiday, they will have already started work. And so the last day of term comes to a close. The school leavers say goodbye and receive the best wishes of the staff for their future careers. But everywhere there is excitement, the tension of term time is over. And as the children stream out of the school gates on this, the shortest day of the year, we know that in a very little time, school will be forgotten. And young hearts will be looking forward to the season of merriment and good cheer and a season of thanksgiving, peace, and goodwill to all men.
Winter by William Shakespeare When icicles hang by the wall And Dick the shepherd blows his nail And Tom bears logs into the hall And milk comes frozen home in pail When blood is nipped and ways be foul Then nightly sings the staring owl To it too a merry note While greasy Joan doth kill the pot When all aloud the wind doth blow and coughing drowns the parson's saw, And birds sit brooding in the snow, And Marion's nose looks red and raw, When roasted crabs hiss in the bowl, Then nightly sings the staring owl, To it too, a merry note, While greasy June doth kill the pot. There's no doubt that in Buckinghamshire in January it snows and it is very cold. But what is it like in San Francisco or Peking? Curiosity about what happens in other countries is natural. Not only what the weather is like, of course, but what grows there, how people live, what they sell to other countries, and what they need from other countries. So, in the geography lesson, the teacher brings to life the atlas, the globe, and the text of the book, and the children learn about the peoples of the world, their neighbours. The St. Lawrence Seaway was opened by the Queen in 1959 and it's designed to connect up Montreal to the Great Lakes so that ocean-going ships, not ships the size of Queen Mary, but normal ocean-going ships can travel right up the Great Lakes by the well end of the Sioux Canals right up to the head of Lake Superior. If geography lessons help us to understand people now living in other parts of the world, the history lesson answers this sort of question. How do things come to be as they are? Our clothes, our furniture, our houses. What sort of houses have and their ancestors before them? How far back can we go in time? How did it all begin? What can we learn from the discoveries of archaeologists? What can a museum teach us? I come from Los Angeles, California. My ma and pa came over to England for a little while, and I was sent to this English school. I guess that one of the interesting things that happened to me was the visit that we had to Bury Ulamian. That's a Roman town, you know. We didn't see any Romans, though. I guess they must have left a long time ago. Leastways, that's what it looked like to me, because by the time we got there, most of the place seemed to have fallen down. Anyway, we did see a big wall that must have been several feet thick. Our teachers told us about the part it played in the defense of the ancient city. This wall was built nearly 2,000 years ago by the Emperor Hadrian. The Romans had always recognized the value of local materials, and in the construction of this wall, flints have been used. As you can see, Layers of red tiles have been used for strengthening. The cement used by the Romans was very strong. Stones have been known to flake and crumble with the passage of time, while the cement itself has remained quite sound. The walls of Verulamium were many feet in thickness and reached a height of 15 feet or more. We saw where the southeast, or London Gate, had been, and through this gate ran the famous Watling Street. We are now standing at the southeast gate, at which point Watling Street enters the city of Verulamium. The towers of the gate stood on the base of stones which is... Then we went to the Hypercost. This was a kind of central heating system 
that they had in Roman times. It was in the form of a furnace that burned beneath the mosaic floor. I guess that the Romans liked the idea of keeping their feet warm. Nearly all the Roman villas had heating of this sort. The idea was that the hot air kept the whole house warm as well as the floor, so it seems that many of our modern ideas are not really new at all. This beautiful mosaic floor is in excellent condition. The colors of the small tiles are still bright and show the design clearly. You will notice that the floor has sunk a little in one or two places, and this is probably due to the crumbling of the underground heating system. The next thing that we saw was the Roman theater. You see, they didn't have any television or movies in those days, so they used to sit out in the open air in a big circular theater and act plays to one another. That must have been very nice on a hot summer's afternoon, but it couldn't have been much fun on a chilly winter's day like the day we went there. We could see quite clearly the acting area in the center, while around about there was tier after tier of seating accommodation. is the only one known in Britain and is in many respects different from those found elsewhere. The normal shape of a Roman theater was in the form of a semicircle, but here we have the shape of a horseshoe. A group of theaters in northern France are similar in design, and these, together with the Veriolamium theater, are different from those built in the south of Europe. They have small stages, obviously not intended for ordinary dramatic after the theater, we went to the museum. We saw some of the relics that had been found on the site, pottery, jewelry, glassware, and so on. We also saw models and pictures showing what the place was like in Roman times. saw a real Roman that someone had dug up in their backyard, but he didn't look very good. I guess I learned quite a lot that day, something I'll be able to tell the folks back home about what we did at school in England. Boxing is a sport that plays its part in the physical education of the boys and during the spring term a boxing tournament is held. Boys of similar ages and weights are matched together, each boy representing his house as a member of a team. Each bout is of three two-minute rounds, the PE master acting as referee and members of staff acting as judges. The boys who take part as seconds see to it that the sponge and towel play their part as thoroughly as they do in more ambitious boxing promotion, amateur or professional. As for the young boxers themselves, this experience teaches them quite a lot of things besides developing self-confidence and self-reliance. One point that the boys appreciate more readily is that boxing is more than just hitting the other fellow. There are good reasons for the sport being called no blast of self-defense. Remember the pavilion begun six months ago? It's a proud moment for these boys when the roof is on that pavilion. Another job that gives satisfaction, the glazing of the windows. Once a year, usually in late February, there's a rather special kind of football match. Special because the boys' team is going to play the teachers. Somehow or other, the masters manage to scrape together a team, and the match is refereed by the games mistress. It is a well-known fact 
that all the masters get very bad tempered for a few days before the match. But we don't pay any attention because we know that they probably lay awake at nights. We boys are faced with the problem of deciding whether or not to let up after the fourth or fifth goal so as not to spoil the match. But after thinking of all the lines and detentions that we have had through the year, our minds are made up. We are going to wipe them out. Of course, we scored within the first few minutes, but perhaps it was a little unfair because they're still moving very slowly. Quite a lot of them were over 30, you know. But our first goal put the wind up them. I think that they are more annoyed than anything. Anyway, things started to get moving, and before we knew where we were, everybody was charging around like an express train. Final score, boys one goal, staff two goals. Earth now is green and heaven is blue, lively spring which makes all new, jolly spring that enters Sweet young sunbeams do subdue angry, aged winter. Blasts are mild and seas are calm. Every meadow flows with balm. The earth wears all her riches. Harmonious birds sing such a psalm as ear and heart bewitches. Reserve, sweet spring, this nymph of ours, eternal garlands of thy flowers. Green garlands never wasting. In her shall last our state's fair spring, now and forever flourishing, as long as heaven is lasting. With the passing of winter, the school once more becomes a brighter place. Flowers and animals waken up, and the inevitable jars of frog spawn, the hallmark of any school, make their appearance. By the time the young tadpoles emerge, summer will almost be here. It is at about this time that the Easter holiday occurs and it is welcomed by everyone for it is an opportunity to gather strength for the coming summer term which is in many ways the busiest and most tiring of the year. For a while after the holiday the pattern of work goes on despite the attractions of the longer days and better weather and the open windows and the still air bring the reminder that somewhere in the school a music lesson is going on. Besides singing together, pupils receive a wider education in music, learning about the various instruments of the orchestra, percussion, brass, woodwind and strings. They learn too about the way in which music has developed historically, about the great composers and their lives. The stories of Mendelssohn, Mozart, Brahms, Schubert, Purcell and other famous names are told and their music is heard through the medium of the gramophone. Two of our favourites are Bach and Handel, and their lives and music are compared. They were born in the same year and were both fine organists, but in other ways they were very different. Bach lived and worked in Germany, while Handel was greatly travelled and settled and died in England. Handel came from an unmusical family, and he never married, while Bach was born of musical parents, and he himself married twice and had twenty children. This knowledge of the composers helps us to appreciate the wider significance of classical music. The music teacher, however, 
does not lose sight of the fact that young people today are often interested in other kinds of music as well, and often a few minutes is set aside at the end of a lesson to play a record of one of the current pop. In the summer term, the boys put the finishing touches to the sports pavilion, painting it and clearing ground around it. The girls come to the boys' aid with the curtaining of the windows. It certainly won't be long before the pavilion is in use. And so the work is completed in good time for the athletic season. Meanwhile, on the field itself, the goalposts have been taken down and the running tracks are marked out. But the two physical education teachers are not restricted to the school premises, as they will tell you. At the beginning of the athletic season, a party of 30 girls and boys was taken to the Bucks Education Committee Camp School at Short Mills near Charlton St Giles. For a week, concentrated instruction was given in all athletic events with the help of two members of the county physical education staff in addition to the school's own teachers. Most of these sessions took place outside in the spacious grounds, although time was allowed for indoor activities including weight and circuit training and gymnastics. As the week progressed, noticeable progress was made by the whole party in all events, particularly in hurdling and throwing. Shot putting was introduced to the girls and in the short time available a reasonable standard was reached. In order to test the children's attainments, an intergroup athletic competition was held on the last morning and the close results and high level of performance showed the benefit derived from the course. Meals were taken in the communal dining hall and each table had a different duty to perform daily. These included washing up, serving and the laying of tables. There were separate dormitories for boys and girls, a member of staff being in charge of each dormitory. After lunch each day, there was a rest period spent in the dormitories when the children wrote letters or relaxed in preparation for the afternoon's activities. After supper each evening, the children spent their time in the recreation hut where they played table tennis, cards and listened, or if they had any energy left, danced to the gramophone records. swimming pool is being refilled and with the coming of the warmer weather swimming instruction again takes its place as a regular part of the physical education timetable. The basic aim of the school is a simple one, every pupil a swimmer, but before actual swimming exercises begin various confidence practices are carried out so that there is no feeling of strangeness in the water. The pool itself is specially designed for non-swimmers and even at its deepest part, no child can be out of his or her depth. The actual swimming exercises themselves are of two types, those that a child can practice by herself and those carried out with a partner. The latter are especially useful, 
for the feeling of movement through the water given by a towing or wheelbarrow practice is conducive to quick learning, the child concentrating on the swimming movement without the worry of perhaps going under and getting a mouthful of water. Although there is only one swimming bath between nearly 450 children, we try as far as possible to let every child get in the water at least once a week. Some manage more than this, however, as very often a member of staff will stay behind after four o'clock to supervise extra swimming for those who are keen. Here is a class of first-year boys, and on, although this is only their first summer at the school, many of them are already able to swim. Some, it is true, were able to do so before they came here, but others have learned only this term. There's a lot to be said for a swim pool, but how much more to be said for the sea? Although our school is well inland, we are still within range of a day's outing to the coast. But these boys and girls of second year are not going to the seaside primarily for a swim. They are going for a day's field work in connection with their biology lessons. The study of the shore forms part of the course and books, pictures and an aquarium are a great help. But there's nothing quite like going to the actual location itself, if that's at all possible. Fortunately, there is a spot near Brighton which abounds in rock pools, and that is where the coaches are heading for. One of the commonest creatures to be found is the shore crab. There is hardly a pool in which will not be found several of this species. They belong to the class Crustacea, which in turn belongs to the phylum of animals known as arthropods, or joint-legged animals. Strange as it may seem, they are closely related to the well-known barnacles, which are found in crossing nearly every rock which is covered by the tide. Another well-known animal is limpet, this belongs to the phylum known as mollusks and is related to the garden snail. There is also the sea anemone, which is not a plant as many people imagine. The day was a very enjoyable and instructional one for us, and we learned a great deal about the rather unique environment that is the shore. I think that many of us will find new pleasures and excitements next time we go for a holiday by the sea. But if the ocean and its depths have their fascination, so too has the other extreme, especially for the boys. The Air Training Corps is an organization which caters for those boys who have interests in aviation. At the same time, any boy who favors a career in any of the fighting services has a foretaste of what he is likely to encounter. But for any boy, whatever his plans, there is much to be said for the discipline and technical experience that he will gain by joining a pre-service organization, such as this. The Chalfont's 2313 Squadron Air Training Corps was begun at the school and has its headquarters at the school. Most of its members are boys who are attending or have attended the school, while members of the teaching staff are among the officers and NCOs. A typical training evening includes drill on the square, instruction on aero engines, navigational instruction, and signaling. The boys are very keen to go up in a plane. There are plenty of opportunities for this at various RAF stations, at weekends, and at the annual camp. There is also gliding instruction, and a number of boys have obtained their solo gliding certificates.
features of modern education is the availability of books of every kind, books on hobbies, careers, sport, and on every school subject, not to mention storybooks. Senior pupils act as librarians in the school library. Nearly every child in the school uses his or her borrower's ticket, and usually about 200 books are out on loan at a time. The reference section of the library is also well used, particularly by the senior children and, of course, by the staff. First year children are painting during art lessons. That means they are using colour in all sorts of interesting ways, as their imagination or their observation or their sense of what is right tells them. It's an exciting business, creating a picture in colour. It can be very satisfying too, as also can certain crafts, like this one, basketry. These fourth-year pupils have developed their skills in this craft through patient practice of it and with the sympathetic guidance of the teacher. From the classroom to the workshop, where the first principles are the same, to learn all you can about the tools you use and the materials you work with. Young boys learn how to play in the wood to the right size. This is their beginning. boys who are finishing these pieces of work have come a long way along the path that leads to craftsmanship. They have learned how to make things that they need and how to make them well. Because of this their standards are high and they will not accept ill-designed or shoddily made articles. Many of them too have gained a foundation that will stand firm in their later work, either as an apprentice to a trade or undergoing training in a technical field of some sort. boy at home in a carpenter's workshop. That was 2,000 years ago. 
But in the religious knowledge lesson, the teacher is not teaching history. We are a Christian community, and it is a part of our being educated that we come to a greater understanding of the Christian faith and the Christian way of life. The Gospel according to St. Matthew. Now this begins the New Testament, the New Covenant, and it begins with a Christmas story for all men, not just the Jews. God met men in a new way when Jesus came. Jesus showed them what God his Father is really like. He gives everyone the chance of knowing God so well that they'll want to be his servants. Now, look at first. A boy's or girl's first job on leaving school. Someone who knows just how important this is, the youth employment officer, is here interviewing a boy who is in his last term at school. Also present is the headmaster. Probably the boy knows what kind of work he wants to do. He is having the advice of two experienced men who know between them a great deal about him and about the job he has in mind. In order to help those about to leave school, groups of boys and girls make visits to hospitals, factories, exhibitions and so on. Visiting speakers like this naval officer are also popular. He showed films about life in the Royal Navy today and afterwards answered quite a number of questions. Annual examinations at school may not be popular with the children, but even they appreciate the need for them and they take them seriously. Boys and girls in their final year at school are anxious to reach the pass mark in as many subjects as possible. So are the candidates for the examinations of the UEI, who also sit in June. At the staff meeting which follows, when the school examination results are known, there is a good deal of discussion on how each class in the school should be made up for the next school year. Many factors besides examination marks being taken into account. As the headmaster, I have ideas to put before the staff regarding future policy, particularly such things as new courses of study for children wishing to continue their education after reaching the age of 15, what examinations they may aim at, and so on. A good thing one of the ladies on the staff thoughtfully provided soft drinks at this stage. Another important item on the agenda is the organization of Open Day. It is the school Open Day. Not everyone who would like to be in the school halls for the prize giving and speeches can be accommodated. Older pupils and prize winners are in their places. Parents are flowing in and soon the hall is filled. On the platform are the school governors, the headmaster and the guest speaker, who also gives the prizes and certificates to those pupils who have earned them. making and prize giving over, children show their parents around the school, where in the classrooms representative schoolwork is on view, arranged and set out according to the various subjects taught in the school. Here the opportunity is taken by many parents to have a heart-to-heart -heart chat with the teachers, especially of course with the teacher whose form their boy or girl is in. This contact is valuable to both parent and teacher.
feature of the afternoon is the showing to the parents of the very different types of clothing that the girls have made for themselves in the school needlework room. The girls who wear their blouses and skirts, shorts, pinafore dresses, party frocks and so on, walk in front of their audience and then down the aisle between them, turning to show their garments to the best advantage, while one of the senior girls speaks a commentary on the clothes, mentioning special points like the design, materials and particular features. Later in the day, many of the 11-year-old children who will be coming to the school the following September are measured for school uniforms by the tailor, who especially comes to the school during the early evening. The school year is nearly over now, but there is one more event to come. During the last week of term, the annual athletic meeting is held. This is the climax to all the preparation and training that has been going on during the summer. It is held during the evening as this permits parents and older pupils to come along too. The pole vault is among the more spectacular of the field events and attracts a great deal of attention. The headmaster at the microphone keeps up a commentary on what is happening besides announcing the events. The track events like the 100 yard sprint are properly timed to within a tenth of a second and the jumping and throwing carefully measured as competitors gain certificates for achieving performances which reach certain standards. The whole sport is run as a house competition, points being gained by those who are placed first, second, third or fourth. At the end, the winning house is announced and the sports captains come forward to receive the cup on behalf of their house. This is the last day of term and the last day of the school year. Tomorrow the school will be closed and empty. Empty, say, for the caretaker and the cleaner who will work through most of the holiday preparing the school for the next term. But today there is activity everywhere. The last day of term, and especially the last day of the summer term, is always a busy time. Books and equipment, tools and apparatus, all these have to be checked and put away. Registers have to be closed and arrangements made to look after plants and livestock during the holiday. In the morning, a coach draws up outside the school. It is the coach to take a party of 24 children and three teachers on the first stage of a journey to the continent for a 10-day holiday. The coach will take them to Victoria Station. Here they will catch a Continental Express and by this time tomorrow they will be in Switzerland. And as the day progresses, so the tasks are finished. The hustle and bustle of the morning gradually subsides. The clock moves on, and at about three o'clock the message goes round that we are all to go to the hall. To the younger children, it means no more than the end of another school term. But to the fourth year, and even some third year children, this moment is of special significance. It means that their school days are almost over. Next week, or the week after, many will have started work. Others will be looking forward to student days at a college of further education. Perhaps as we stand here at this very last assembly, our minds are going back to our first day at this school. We really were just children then, and the school seemed a strange and foreboding place. But we settled down and as the years went by, we grew up together, and the school became part of our lives. Now we are leaving it. We are not yet adults, but our outlook has changed, and we are ready to place our feet on the first rung of the ladder of the outside world. So our thoughts bring us back to reality. In a few minutes now, we shall be dismissed. We shall collect our belongings, and for the last time as pupils of this school, 
You shall walk across the playground, through the gate and down the drive, and our school days will be over. And so the wheel will turn full circle as the new school year begins in September. For those who are coming back, it will mean moving into a higher form with new work to tackle and new subjects to learn. And there will be a new first year ready to make a start on the work that lies ahead. The new school year will be a little different from the old one. There will be alterations and improvements. For the story of a school is a story of progress. And each succeeding year will bring its changes. Changes in the school and changes in the faces of those who belong to the school. But the story will go on, as it will go on in a hundred thousand other schools. The story of teaching and learning, of growing up and finding a place in the world. And it is a story that has no ending. Thank you.